All right, 34-point loss in the rearview mirror. What holds uh, in store for West Virginia football for the rest of the season? Well, they got to deal with an undefeated TCU team coming to town on Saturday. This is our Mountaineers show that we bring you each and every Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time. So pull up a chair, join in, get comfortable. Before, before you do, please hit the like button. And uh, that helps us build the channel here at the Voice of College Football and hopefully over on the West Virginia channel. We want you to subscribe there. We got Paul on the line, Mountaineer Paul, to help us uh, break things down for the next 60. Paul, appreciate you being here. What's going on? Well, you know, TCU, uh, if there's one game they've struggled in, it's against West Virginia, and it's at West Virginia. And so we're hoping, similar to the Baylor curse, that that continues tomorrow. There it is. Yeah. Uh, this TCU team, I don't think there are too many souls out there outside of TCU camp that really believe that their long-term full season undefeated team, you know, they can certainly beat everybody on their schedule, but I think most of us expect them to trip up. So why not in Morgantown? Yeah. All right. Good stuff. All right, uh, folks, we're going to take your comments and questions there in the live chat, and uh, we will deliver them to Paul. Uh, before we get to some uh, coaching possibilities, some rumors and news that's out there, your take on the Texas Tech game, you're probably tired of thinking about it, tired of talking about it, want to put it away, but can, can you give us one last take on it, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean – you know, Baron Morton did whatever he wanted to do all day long. Uh, we we looked unenergized. We looked depleted. Um, I don't even, you know, we were never in the game in the game to even be out coached. Um, you know, it was uh, it was similar to Texas in that it looked like we didn't belong on the same field. And you know, one of my biggest takeaways from the game was I looked at the five year run of recruiting for each team. I took into account who had left transfer portal or otherwise, and there's just no way that it, that the talent disparity, even still with the losses on the back end for us, is not so great that we should be getting beat like we did. And so, you know, coming from the West Virginia side of things, it's been a four-year run for Neil Brown, and I, I know we talk about him a lot and how he's done such an awful job this year for us, or at least a lot of us view it that way. More of a roller coaster. You know, it seems like we're consistently mediocre. If there's anything that we're consistent at, and and we're just really tired of that. Um, you know, <laughs> it's just one of those things where we're just ready to see a change, uh, and really don't care who it is. So, did you like the hire when it was first made? Oh, absolutely. Who didn't? You know, I think he was um, one of the hottest coaches based on what he had done, especially on the road as a coach, that was his MO. They went to places and they beat people. They went to Lincoln and beat a pretty good Nebraska team. I think it was an eight-win Nebraska team that year. They beat on the road in Lincoln. They go to LSU and beat an LSU team that that wasn't, you know, your typical LSU team, but was also an eight-win LSU team or nine-win LSU team. And so the expectation was with better recruiting, better facilities, um, you think that would continue in Morgantown, and it has not. Um, Neil Brown has all, <laughs> never won more than three road games in any given season since he's been in Morgantown. So it's it's been a tough road to hoe for him, especially on the road. Thank goodness we're at home. Uh, and I will say that if, if there's one thing we've done good since Neil Brown's been in town, it's been home. You know, we've been pretty good there. But, uh, yeah, I, and – Looking at the higher when it first happened, obviously three double-digit win seasons at Troy, that's something we were all all looking towards. Uh, so there was some sustained success there. And it just hasn't translated. And, and I was talking to somebody yesterday about this. It just makes no sense in so many ways because the culture is there. The locker room is there. The way the kids speak about him is there the way the kids parents speak about him is there the way the fans speak about him is there the way he deals with the media is there so many components but the one that matters and it's just it's hard to wrap your mind around i don't know exactly what the disconnect is 
Um, if it's X's and O's, evaluation of talent, not really sure what it is. Um, but it's been really frustrating to try to figure out. Talking West Virginia football with all of you each and every Friday night. We've done this now 43 consecutive weeks. We appreciate Mountaineer Paul being here. Please check out his channel. We will leave the uh, link in the live chat so you can go right there uh, to talk West Virginia football and uh, check out uh, Paul's content. Uh, we will talk uh, West Virginia TCU coming up. We got Melissa Treewasser from Frogs Today coming up to join the conversation. And of course, we're going to get more into Neil Brown. So leave those comments and questions there in the live chat. Do you think he's assembled a good staff? No, uh, I think that's probably one of the biggest indictments on Neil Brown is the saying we've heard come out of Morgantown here lately is Neil Brown's Neil Brown's friends are going to get him fired. The most famous example would be defensive coordinator, Jordan Leslie being selected over a die who is now at Miami and has taken, if not the best defensive player off of West Virginia's team, one of the best in Akeem Mesidor, who just had a three-sack game the other day. Uh, when he left to go to Georgia, initially he took freshman All-American Tyke Smith with him. Uh, when he came from Arizona to West Virginia, he brought some players as well. That's kind of kind of uh, his – that's, that's been his M.O. But a lot of us felt like we had one of the better coach back ends in the country – and a lot of us felt like he, he played at West Virginia. And there was really no reason other than he and Jordan Leslie were really good friends for him to get that defensive coordinator job over a die. So it's been one of those situations where he, you know, he does the offensive line coach, Matt Moore, coached with him at Texas Tech. The offensive line, even though we return all five starters, has been really inconsistent. 200 yard game against Baylor, who by all accounts should be a better defense than Texas Tech. You go on the road to Texas Tech, and they absolutely dominate the line of scrimmage. You just, it's just reverse logic. You wouldn't think that would happen. If you rush for 200 against Baylor, you'd think you would do it against Tech. Didn't happen. And that's been the story for the entire time they've been here. So there are some good staff members on the team. I'm not going to say there's not any good staff. But where it matters, in the trenches, on the back end, unfortunately hasn't been good. Got Mountaineer Paul here talking up West Virginia football. We do this each and every Friday night, 8 o'clock Eastern time. So jump on board here at the Voice of College Football. Get on the West Virginia channel as well. I have left the uh, link in the live chat and get on over to Mountaineer Paul's channel as well. So we're going to take a look at the schedule here. Give me, Paul, what you think neil brown needs to do to keep his job and if there's any difference what you what you would do if you were running the show if you were his boss what you would expect out of him what you would need to see and then obviously you know what that answer is but what to take a shot at what do you think the administration thinks could happen um well definitely neil brown and shane Lyons are in bed together i think that's Pretty well documented. Uh, Neil Brown is Shane Lyons guy, um, evidenced by the fact that after a six and four shortened COVID season, he gave him the buyout, which is $20 million. Um, even though we all know it's not going to be quite that much. And so Shane Lyons is rooting for Neil Brown to succeed. Were he to go on a run towards the end of the season, maybe he pulls the upset against TCU tonight or tomorrow. Uh, maybe he wins against Oklahoma, a team that we've never beaten since we've been in the Big 12. Um, there, he has some chances to give Shane Lyons a reason to keep him around. <laughs> you know, but he also could go the other way and handcuff Shane Lyons to where he has no other choice and to where President Gordon Gee will, ha will have to fire Shane Lyons as well if he doesn't do something about the situation. Um, and so obviously if it were me, um, I think I've seen all I needed to see after these four years, obviously. Uh, even if he were to win out and we win eight games, that would be a statement, but we've seen that before. He did that two years ago. We won, we won four in a row at the end of the season and won a bowl game over Army. That's not translated into anything, so I don't see why winning four in a row at the end of this season for me would – convince me of much of anything. He's still been, been inconsistent, mediocre as a coach. 
But Shane Lyons, I believe, if he were to do that and possibly even seven wins, may even give him the ammo he needs to go to the President Gee and say, hey, I think, you know, because he's also got this recruiting class in his back pocket, which is hovering right around top 25, depending on the week. But it's been as high as 22nd in the country. Uh, there's a lot of really high-end four-star players in there that um, – talking about Jeremiah Trotter Jr., the, the former – Jeremiah Trotter, who was an all-pro linebacker, his son, Justin Bitten, who played at IMG Academy, is a high-end four-star player. Rodney Gallard, Rodney Gallagher Jr., who is a four-star player out of Pennsylvania. Uh, several of these kids that are highly, highly coveted players um, give you a second thought when thinking about getting rid of Neil Brown because the one thing you can say about him is this culture that he's created. A lot of these kids want to come play for him, and they talk about this family atmosphere that he has. But unfortunately, it's, it's which one do you which poison do you want to pick? Because I, like I was telling Coos earlier, I think we just need to cut bait with all of it. And whoever we lose, we lose in the process. You play for the school and not the coach anyway. But we all know that's not how it really is. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's pretty much my take on that. Yeah, I, I never agreed with keeping a coach around because of a recruiting class. I just think the coach is so much more than any particular recruiting class. And if you don't feel confident that you can go get a coach who is going to be able to assume to a certain degree, salvage that recruiting class. But even if you, even if you lose 20 spots in a recruiting class because of a coach, well, if you're hiring the right guy going forward, then he's going to make up for that in so many different ways. So now Obviously, the recruiting has to be taken into consideration in evaluating a coach. That's a different thing. That, yeah. That's part of the job. That's actually step one of the job is talent acquisition, <laughs> whether that's through the transfer portal now or obviously traditional high school recruiting. So that's that's job number one, talent acquisition. Yeah. So that's that's part of the evaluation. But I, I see that as different than making a decision. Oh, we're going to keep this coach because we got the. 17th rated class in the country and we usually are around 35 so we better keep him no no yeah you don't have confidence that he's the right guy see ya and you drop 20 spots but you got a better coach if you know what you're doing and then you move on from there absolutely i agree with you 100 percent. and and that seems to be the situation we're in um there are some players that you know me personally as a fan i hate to see the possibility of losing but at the end of the day, like you were saying, it seems like Neil Brown and staff at this point are having a really hard time with the talent acquisition process and evaluation process. Just, you know, we've heard, you know, I've mentioned this several times in other shows and on your show, but I just can't get over the fact that we were told for an entire summer that just as much as we heard about C.J. Donaldson and how good he was going to be, and that proved to be true, so I want to give credit where credit's due in that aspect. They were right about him. But also the four, uh, we had four transfers in the, in the back end come in during the offseason. They were to replace four power five starters. These guys were grabbed either from a mixture of group of five, junior college, um, places like that. And we were told that they, although they were coming from smaller places in the FCS, junior college, and group of five, that they had the measurables that they were looking for at a height, weight, length standpoint, and also speed. Uh, they also gave us pro football focus grades uh, to, to back some of this up, which are in the high 80s in some cases in Wesley McCormick. And so we really bought into this, and we drunk the Kool-Aid. And these guys have come in and been truly one of the worst secondaries in all of the country. And it hasn't been close. And, and it's been alignment, assignment, and a physical deal to where they're physically getting beaten. And when they're not getting physically beaten by these, even when they're lined up, when they are in the right spots, they're still so badly beaten from a talent standpoint that they're still not sticking with these guys and they're losing contested catch battles, dropping interceptions, 50-50 balls they're not coming down with, two interceptions as a whole for the entirety of the season right now. Just not acceptable. Not acceptable at all. And you won't win any games with that kind of turnover differential. No doubt about that. Uh, and TCU comes to town, a hot ball club, pretty fortunate ball club at the same time. But 
you know, they've run yeah. into a few backup quarterbacks and certainly had an issue with uh, Kansas State last week for three quarters down 28 to 10. Yeah. I was watching that ball game and even the it wasn't so much Adrian Martinez getting hurt. It was backup quarterback Howard. He was tearing them up as well, playing well. It was when they had to go to the third stringer for Kansas State. Then, of course, uh, hey, they had a great comeback uh, down 17 against Oklahoma State the week before as well. But uh, TCU coming to West Virginia to take on the Mountaineers. So, Paul, why don't we get to the uh, the interesting news of the day uh, involving another coach uh, just a state away there in, at Liberty who's having a pretty darn good football season. He's one point away from a undefeated record for Liberty as they only lost to Wake Forest, the top 15 team in the country by one point. So what do you make of all the uh, various rumors circulating about Hugh Freeze in West Virginia? Man, he's, you know, whoever his agent is, I'm if I ever make it, I'm going to hire him because he leveraged us good. Uh, you know, rumors been flying out of Morgantown all, town all week, several sources that I have, several sources, sources that other people have. If they were on the show, I would say their names. Um, we all heard, and we were told that, yes, Hugh Freeze and his management had reached out to West Virginia just in case Neil Brown doesn't make it. He wants to be in Morgantown, which would be a great fit for him, no doubt. Um, and then the next thing we know, he signs one of the greatest group of five deals in history, $5 million a season for a group of five coaches just out of this world. That's better than, I think, right around – it's top – 40, 50, you know, so, I mean, it's certainly power five money uh, and even more than Neil Brown makes, which is kind of funny. And so he set himself up good to where he's in a no pressure situation at Liberty. Uh, the playoff has been extended. So he's going to have a chance to get into that thing now in a low pressure situation with, uh, if you let him tell it, these Christian values that he, he seems to say he abides by now, even though he was supposed to before we all make mistakes. I get that. Um, so if he has changed, he's at a place that lines up with his faith and his, the way he wants to live. And it's a low pressure situation. I wouldn't be surprised if he just keeps that job, but a lot of people feel like now that it's going to take an sec type situation to pull him away from there. Um, I wouldn't count out West Virginia in that situation, um, at all, but, um, that's me speaking probably through some golden, golden blue colored glasses, but. Um, because, you know, he's just been so good there. Um, I, I'd like to see him in Morgantown, but I've got a couple other guys. I think David Shaw's a really underrated guy. Uh, I think would do really well in Morgantown. I made a video this week about five minority coaches that I think have, are, are being overlooked right now. Every list I'd seen from West Virginia were nothing but white coaches, and I'm not saying that uh, trying to make this political or anything. I just felt like that. There, there were five that need to maybe have a little light shined on them. David Shaw being one of those guys. Yeah, so check out that video, everyone. Um, yeah, we will not unveil the rest of those names. Would like everyone to check out uh, Paul's list of uh, minority candidates for the head coaching position if Neil Brown doesn't make it. Yeah, Hugh Freeze, Liberty agreed to a new eight-year contract through 2030. Yeah. Hmm. Heck of a deal. Who's playing well on this football team? <laughs> Zach Frazier, offensive lineman. You know, he, he's uh, he's been steady Eddie through it all. Uh, he you know graded out at 97% against Ika, one of the best nose tackles in the country. Uh, truly remarkable performance. And then on the road last week, Texas Tech, it, I just don't know what happened. But uh, he's been playing well up until the injury. C.J. Donaldson obviously playing as well as any running back in the Big 12 outside of Bijan. Um, he's back healthy now. Um, I, you know, personally, I feel like J.T. could be playing better, but we'll get to that. Um, that's really about it. I, if you can't, if it's not somebody on our offensive line, our wide receivers aren't getting separation. A quarterback's been less than average. Uh, a couple of the running backs, Tony Mathis, Justin Johnson, and C.J. Donaldson, have all had their moments. Uh, Bryce Ford Wheaton splashed early and has faded off. It's really been a disappointment all the way around. 
and I think if you ask anybody else that covers this team uh, to any extent like myself, they would say a lot of the same things. Um, very few positives right now, really. Well, as uh, we're reminding everyone on the banner there, you can join us right here for West Virginia TCU post game live with uh, Country Roads podcast. Uh, we appreciate them doing a uh, post game for us for West Virginia here at the Voice of College Football. And, you know, the mood's been so down with all the losing. We want to pick it up a little yeah. bit. We got to bring in Melissa Trebowasser to talk about a winning team would be good. <laughs> Listen, do here. not put that Morgantown jinx on me today. I'm not here <laughs> for it. So. Oh, there I'm, it I'm is. putting it on you. I'm putting it on you. We need it. Um, I'm not saying you guys don't want to stand defeated, but we want you to lose a game. It, <laughs> I want, you know, it blows you know, my I mind. I want it to be this weekend, but yeah, I, I listen. TCU has not beaten Neil Brown. Has not won at West Virginia since 2014 when Jaden Obercrom walked it off. So um, you know, as, uh, as good as we're feeling about TCU and and the success they've had this season, um, I'm never gonna see an away game on the schedule in Morgantown and think that's going to be a walk in the park, no matter what the state of the Mountaineers is at the time. Absolutely. Well, it's weird different. looking at these two rosters too. I'm sorry, Mark. No, go ahead, Paul. Just looking at these two rosters, you know, outside of Jarrett Dagey in Morgantown, uh, a lot of this, a lot of familiar faces on the TCU roster I saw last year going into that game. Uh, and it blows me away. The, the, the place that you guys are in and where we're at, with a lot of the same faces, um, what a job Sonny Docks has done. Uh, truly, truly amazing job. He's got to be on the short list of Coach of the Year candidates at this point. Um, just really impressive that he could take that roster, constructed the way it was, and I know there's been some pieces added. I'm not saying there hasn't been. But um, I think Max Duggan was left for dead, a lot of people thought. Uh, resurrected that guy's career. Just amazing. Really amazing. I've been I've been a fan outside of this week watching them this year. Well, you know, one of my favorite Gary Pattersonisms was always that you know you've got the same guys coming back, which can mean good things or bad things because you've got the same guys coming back, and so you look at a roster that couldn't get to bowl eligibility a season ago, returned eighty two percent of their production on both offense and defense. Um, they're playing the same guys. I mean, they're like you said, there were a couple key pieces, and when you look at what Alana Lee has done on the offensive line. Mark Perry and Johnny Hodges have been big additions defensively. Um, and uh, of course, Josh Newton too. But outside of that, yeah. it's the guys that have been around um, and, and unlocking their potential. Yeah. I mean, Sonny Dykes is going to lose coach of the year to Josh Heupel would be my guess if Tennessee keeps this up, but um, it's not for lack of trying. Um, I think, yeah. you know, sometimes a fresh voice in the locker room and, and a shift in culture and the thing that Sonny Dykes did, was just 180 degrees different from literally everything that Gary Patterson did, from access to the media, from the way that practices are run, nutrition, weight training, all of those things. And he took those guys, he gave them a belief in themselves, they believe in the system. And offensively, I mean, you look at what he did at SMU and La Tech, uh, there's no reason for them not to think, you know, that, that he could do yeah. the same thing for TCU. And I think that's why players have really bought in. Well, I do know that uh, even though you're a bit uh, leery of the the Morgantown jinx, uh, you know, a double digit deficit's not going to scare you because <laughs> the, the the last two weeks I've really been focused on TCU, Oklahoma State, and Kansas State. You know, I saw Oklahoma State play Texas. I saw your game against Kansas State. I saw your game against Oklahoma State. That, that watching those three play have been really interesting over the last several weeks, and obviously. <laughs> You guys made it work last week. Yeah, I mean, I think that the great thing about the Big 12 is, is top to bottom, you can't take a, a team for granted. Um, it is as strong a league as you're going to find in the country, and arguably it's the strongest league. Um, it's got to be among the most well co best coach, too. Um, you know, obviously West Virginia is not off to the start that they were hoping in year four of the Neil Brown era, but just ask Baylor how easy it is to win a game in Morgantown. You know, second string quarterbacks, we don't talk about those around TCU right now as a negative. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to give a lot of credit to just, again, just the the culture and, and the feeling and the locker room and the voice that Sonny Dykes and the leadership on, on these TCU players, what they've been able to accomplish. Um, this team has fallen behind by massive deficits against really good football teams in each of the last two weeks. And it's come out of halftime thinking it was legitimately a 0-0 zero, zero ball game. And so um, I, I think that just their ability to fight and um, um, to fight and, and make sure that, that they they never are going to give up, I think has been the difference for TCU. 
Chandler Morris still the backup right now? Is he is he still is he was injured earlier? Uh, is he okay now? Uh, you know, that's been a really interesting scenario because I think he he did finally rise back up to number two um, on the depth chart for a while. Sam Jackson was there. It, by all appearances, he's fully healthy and available to play. Um, and, you know, obviously has not played since the first half it, or third quarter, I guess, against Colorado. Colorado. Um, yeah. Just, again, another thing to say about Max Duggan. Um, you know, a, a year and a half, just over a year ago, this was a guy who thought his football career might be over because of a heart condition. Um, then he loses yeah. his starting job that he's had for three seasons to to Chandler Morris. Uh, comes in because Morris gets dinged up and and just refuses to relinquish the role. And so, uh, you know, Dykes talked all through fall camp about what a great position he was in, that he was having to make a really difficult decision of which guy was going to start. Um, and I don't think anybody around TC was surprised when Chandler was the guy. I think we were shocked at the way that Max Duggan has played since. Um, and, and, you know, nationally, I think the narrative has been, how do you not root for this kid? Never even thought about entering the transfer portal, which I have zero problem with players entering the transfer portal. I want to be clear about that. But a kid yeah. that loves TCU, loves Fort Worth, wanted to be there, was willing to be, you know, as he told Sonny Dykes, if I need to be the water guy, I'll be the best water guy in college football. Um, and I think, like, he's one of those that really meant it. And um, we hear a lot of those platitudes, but he's lived it out. And he mm -hmm. was ready to go when his time came. And uh, TCU is what TCU is today because of the way that Max Duggan has played. Um, th this is not a defensive program like we've seen the last 25 years. This is an, a team that's got to score to win, and, and Duggan has done almost everything right for the first seven games of the season. Melissa, how We're much? Uh, how crazy is the talk about undefeated season playoff? You know, that's obviously at the forefront of everybody's attention outside of you know, the football program that, that brings it up constantly. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of fun, but, you know, TC fans haven't forgotten 2014. And I think we all know that in order to make the final four, the Frogs are going to have to be undefeated. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we looked at that four game stretch of Oklahoma at Kansas, Kansas state or Oklahoma state, Kansas state, you know, all four, we knew that was going to be a tough stretch when all four ended up being ranked. We thought, oh, no way TC gets through this unscathed, right? Somehow, some way they did. But now you're looking, you have to go to Morgantown. Oh, it's Halloween weekend. Oh, it's homecoming. Oh, Neil Brown's fighting for his job. So that's not a gimme game. And then you get greeted with Texas Tech at home. And if you were paying attention to social media this summer, you know that one's got a little bit extra mm. juice, even more than normal. And then too the often Texas. to play Texas. And oh, yeah, Gary Patterson, who might know a little bit about TCU football <laughs> players. And you follow that up by a trip to, oh, Baylor who TCU ruined Baylor's perfect season a year ago and almost the, almost to the day. So that one's going to have some juice. And then your reward for surviving all of that is, oh, Iowa State, who might be the best defense in the conference. So I, I think that coming into the season, you know, I, I, the, those of us that cover TCU all kind of like, oh, what's the season going to look like? And I think we all said, man, if Sonny Dykes gets this team to seven and five in a bowl game, like we'll, we'll start to see and believe that he's going to do something great. Eight and four, an unbelievable season. Now I'm trying to talk myself into I'm going to be okay with 10 and two and a birth in the big 12 championship. Um, I just, my, my fear now is who's going to be the one that gets to ruin TCU's dream season. You know, is it going to be this weekend at West Virginia? Is it going to be Texas? Please don't let it be Baylor. I can't live like that. But uh, you know, at some point you just kind of keep waiting for the magic to end, but TCU just kind of keeps pulling the rabbit out of their hat. So I don't want to get yeah. ahead of us. Um, if it, it a lot would have to go wrong and not saying it can't, but a lot would have to go wrong for TC not to play in a big 12 championship and getting to Arlington after what this program has endured for the last four years, after letting go of Gary Patterson, after being left for dead and picked to finish seventh in the conference. I, I mean, I think getting there and playing for a big 12 title would be a huge feather in the cap for Sunny Dykes. It'd be super exciting for TCU fans, but yeah, I mean, when you start seven and oh, it'd be a little disappointing when you do eventually lose a game. If you eventually lose a game. And Melissa, you know, you mentioned the reward being Iowa State at the end of the season. If you want to take it a step further, the reward is playing in a Big 12 championship game. And the tough deal for the Big 12 number one seed is unlike any other conference where it's pretty rare to have a rematch in the championship game because you're tagging a team in the other division with a loss. So they usually don't get through. It's very rare. You got to beat somebody you already beat to yeah. then get the college football playoff. 
and it's probably going to be either Oklahoma State or Kansas State, uh, yeah. neither of which we, we saw how those games kind of started out. So um, there's certainly no guarantees here. Um, again, it's just that trying to keep that mantra of one week at a time, one game at a time, enjoy the ride. You had told me seven and zero at this point in the season, the beginning of the season. I would have thought you were you were on crazy pills. So um, it's really fun just just to see TCU winning and not just winning, but playing really really well and playing with a lot of confidence. Um, if they get to eight and zero after this weekend, then yeah, you can start kind of letting the other shoe drop, I guess. But um, at this point, you know the Horn Frogs are on a really good path to ten wins and ten wins in a, a really good bowl game. After the yeah. last time you played in a bowl game was the Cheez It Bowl, which was the greatest bowl game in all of history. Um, but was yeah, it I mean, seven I think to that, six or whatever. Uh, you it was, know, I, I think it seven. Was, it was a rough one. Interceptions, yeah. There were more interceptions than points for the vast majority of that football game, and I'm not complaining. It was hilarious, and I loved covering it. But yeah, I mean, I I I, I am just really trying to stay in the moment. Um, but this is a really talented football team, a flawed football team, especially defensively, but. Uh, a team that's like, why are you going to bet against them at this point? They keep proving that, that that's not a smart play. Anything else, Paul, you got from Melissa? It's just two metrics, two metrics that I really pay attention to that you guys have really, really uh, exceeded at this year is probably the turnover differential and the yards per play. You guys are just really, really good in both of those. Third and then third in the country in yards per play at over seven and a half yards per play a game. It's going to be interesting to see. Charles Woods comes back for this game. He was able to lock up Quentin Johnson last year. Um, we'll see how healthy he is. Uh, he could, If he comes back healthy, he could throw a wrench into this a little bit because when healthy, he is one of the two or three best corners in the Big 12. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You know, I, I think the thing that I've really appreciated about watching Sonny Dykes this season alongside Garrett Riley is their willingness to adjust from game to game. And so – you know, Quentin Johnson was middlingly involved the first couple of games of the season in Kansas. They decided we're going to show you what this guy can do so that we can open up some other things. And they just force fed him the ball. I mean, he's targeted, I think, 18 times in that game, 14 receptions or something ridiculous. The next week against Oklahoma State, they felt they had an advantageous situation. And so they didn't force him the ball, but he was still the primary receiver. By, um, you know, Kansas State, you know, they also have one of the most elite corners in the Big 12 and one of the probably the only guy in the country that can match Quentin Johnston physically and being 6'4 himself. Um, and so that was the Jared Riley game. And so that's the thing that's really fun about TCU's offense this year. And we haven't seen this creativity since 2014 is that, yeah, if you decide you're going to take away Quentin Johnston, you got to deal with Jared Wiley over the middle of the field in the red zone. You got to deal with Darius Davis, who might well be the fastest player in the conference, if not the fastest player in the country. And then if you decide to take away all of those things, oh, Kendra Miller is among the the con country's leaders in yards per carry too. And so um, I'm not saying it's not all going to go to heck one of these weeks, but I've been really impressed with the adjustments that, that this team is making, not just week to week in the game plan, but from the first half to the second half. Um, there's just a lot of ways they can beat you and they can beat you with the big play or they can beat you with death by a thousand cuts. Um, and so far they've been shown that they've been able to do both within the same 60 minutes. Um, and that to me is what kind of makes me feel like TCU's going to score. The question's always going to be, are they going to stop you from scoring or are they going to keep protecting the football? Because they've done such an excellent job. I mean, Max Duggan has one interception so far, knock on wood. Um, and that was at the end of a half on kind of a Hail Mary play against Kansas. And so that's really been, like you said, one of the biggest difference makers for the Frogs this season. You know, folks out there, we should be giving Melissa a round of applause just because of great analysis. But on top of that, she's on vacation, so she should be like mentally checked out. And so for Melissa, for you to like completely deliver, even under those circumstances, and just to be here on vacation talking to us is amazing. Well, I've been waiting for the Mai Tais until, until okay. after. So uh, <laughs> nice. this game tomorrow kicks off at 6 a.m. Uh, so we'll, we'll be doing mimosas and college football at 6 a.m. Oh, my goodness. Barely be lied out, but, you know, I'll be watching. Sweet. Melissa Treepwasser, Frogs Today. Get on over there. Check out uh, what Melissa has on her, YouTube, on her uh, Twitter. There you see it there, Coach <laughs> Melissa. Melissa, thank you so much for stopping by. Have a great rest of your vacation. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, guys. Sure. Great meeting you. Bye. You as well. All right. Good She's stuff. Great. Melissa. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I don't know what the point spread on this game. I don't think it's that healthy considering the the records of the two teams. Um, TCU seven the last I checked. Respect. How much? Seven. We we yeah. were getting seven. TCU's not going to get that much respect out of Vegas, and and it's on the road, of course. So, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, I would I'll tell you. Um, it's going to be close on that. It's, if it stayed at seven, I don't know which which way the, the money poured in. Um, I, I would imagine towards the TCU end of things, if it was only seven, because that's where it was at the beginning of the week. And I would imagine most people would jump on that based on how West Virginia has played against Tech and Texas. They've been blown out in two games this year. So TCU, a very similar team to those teams, explosively-wise, opportunistic on defense-wise. So be interesting to see where the money came in uh, and what the spread is now because I haven't checked it since earlier in the week. Yeah, it, it doesn't. Uh, for those people that are looking on the surface, it, it doesn't look like a seven-point game. But then again, we overreact. Typically, betters overreact, or not the sharp money. The you know the novice the, betters overreact. The casual fan, forty-eight to ten. Yeah. 48 yeah. to 10 catches people's eye versus undefeated team. No doubt yeah. about that. Okay, Paul, you posted something on Twitter this week about JT Daniels. And just I so I don't decipher it or communicate it incorrectly, I wanted to come from you in regards to what you you posted on Twitter and what your belief is about what uh, the decision should be going down the stretch uh, about JT Daniels. Well, you look at it, a uh, five-star arm uh, and, and a guy that came in with a lot of expectations. He's had an offensive line that's protected him for the most part. And yet when I look at it and I got to dive into the numbers some, I saw that through seven games, JT Daniels has thrown for one 300 yard game and he's thrown the three touchdowns once in a game. They were both against Kansas. Outside of that, nothing. He's thrown for under 200 yards in a game twice. We're under 500. He's one for seven on rolls to the right, moving with the ball. There's a lot of things to not like about what JT Daniels has done for us this season. A lot of people will say he's the reason we're, we're as many wins as we have. Okay, we can have that conversation. Personally, I've been very underwhelmed by what he's been able to do. Sure, he's made some really big-time throws at times, and obviously the arm talent is there, but we're not constructed offensively and skill position-wise to really suit what he does. He needs clean pockets, and he needs separation, and he's not getting that. These receivers are bottom 50 in the country, numbers-wise, when it comes to getting separation, so he's throwing in the tighter and tighter windows, and, and it's just been really – really, really bad. He's nine touchdowns, six interceptions. I mean, when you look at the numbers, they're terrible. And it's just not something that anybody expected would happen. And yeah, so that's the that's the video of him uh, saying that he was copying Russell Wilson. Uh, Mountaineer Nation, well, let's ride. So I titled it, The Ride is Over, Vince JT Daniels. Um, and, and I just think that we've got a four-star backup and Nico Marchiol, Garrett Green is there. We need some mobility. We need other ways to move the chains. And this is not as much an indictment against JT Daniels as it is the talent surrounding him. I hope that makes sense to some people. Even Terrell Chestnut, former Mountaineer player, and I had a conversation on Twitter this past week. Uh, other people in the Mountaineer community that have played the game at the college level asking why is JT Daniels running zone read with passing concepts when there is no chance he's going to pull the ball. There's no, there's no reason to even go through that motion. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Backside defensive ends are crashing down on running backs immediately. There's no chance the quarterback pulls the ball. Blitzing cor one time last week, backside defensive end crashes down and they run quarterback blitz. JT Daniels, of course, is rolling this way. Nobody goes with him. The running back gets crushed three times, three yards behind the, uh, the the line of scrimmage. And so with a mobile quarterback, at least you have some kind of 
because our running game has been our best offense. So if we're going to at least give the threat of a quarterback holding that ball, maybe it would help the running game some. Uh, you put Nico Markiel in, who is what a lot of people think the future. Number one, you probably keep him from transferring out, even if Neil Brown is fired. Number two, you get him experience. Uh, is it this week? I don't know. I would at least like to wait until – uh, a couple weeks from now so that he can have a four game stretch and doesn't burn his red shirt. I mean, that would be the, the scenario I think most of us would be happy about, but even if you don't go that route, all three quarterbacks that stand behind JT are non-mobile. So yeah, just really bad numbers. Yeah, in today's game, uh, 63.5%, that's that's fine. It's not great, but it's it's okay. It's fine. The 6.6 .6 yards per pass attempt is much lower than you would want, than you yeah. should be able to get. You know, it speaks to a lot of check downs and just not getting the plays downfield. 10 to 6 is a TD to pick ratio. Again, in today's game, not what you need for a winning quarterback. Oh, that's right. He threw a touchdown last week with three picks. Yeah. Yes. 23 of 30. So I don't think I'm crazy, am I, Mark? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know you're kind of from the outside looking in. And, uh, but we're not, I mean, it's not like we're, he's not beating the world here. Look at, I mean, the numbers are saying and everything. Well, if Neil Brown was the head coach of JT Daniels, meaning that's, what his complete in responsibility was, that would be one thing, but that he's the head coach of West Virginia. He needs to do what's best for the team, for the program. And he's accountable to all the players on the field and on the roster and doing what's best for the program, not, you know, protecting JT Daniels career and trying to set him up for the NFL for as much as I'm sure coaches want to do that for their players. Of course, there's loyalty going back and forth. You got to do what's best for your program. And if it's a lost season and you've got a Nico Markiel who has very little experience, but has the tools to become a really good quarterback, then man, you talk about, you talk about a great time to audition and great reps to get uh, there against the likes of Oklahoma state and Oklahoma and a lot of good teams. Yeah, I'm not saying it's going to be this week. I think Neil, I mean, obviously, the, you think, I mean, I don't think Neil Brown would be a competitor if he didn't think, okay, we've got a shot at 8-5. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's thinking that. And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that. In my heart of hearts, of course, I want us to win out and be 8-5. But it's just not realistic. You have to turn on logical brain at some point and get out of fantasy land. Um, you know, two games on the schedule – that I see that we even have a chance to win down the stretch, just based off how we play. Obviously Iowa state being one of them uh, and Oklahoma, if Dylan Gabriel has an off day. And those are the only two teams that I would feel comfortable talking about as winning against. Uh, unfortunately, offense, not explosive enough defense, not opportunistic to, you know, two turnovers on the season, just absolutely dreadful. Uh, and a back end that's been replaced by FCS talent, group of five talent, and junior college talent. And it's okay if you've got one at that, uh, you know, one junior college FCS or group of five guy that comes in, like we had last year in Charles Woods, who turned out to be a home run, which is why I think they went back in and tried to do it again. I think they found, they thought they found some kind of secret sauce with these FCS transfers and, group of five transfers and things like that. Those lower caliber guys that fit the metrics they're looking for. And it just hadn't worked out. But now you get to replace an entire back end with these guys. It's just going to be a rough, you know, and that's what it's been. Our guy, Connor Johnson, who joins us on a regular basis on all our shows, a big uh, Oregon State Beavers fan. And of course it was <laughs> Oregon State, West Virginia. Who was the third school? I'm forgetting. Missouri. Missouri, yeah, he was down to three. Uh, yeah, well, in Connor Johnson's mind, you know, Corvallis is paradise. Number one. You know, it's yeah. just the place to be. So, again, a bit skewed analysis here, but we love Connor. 
better coaching, pro style offense, great offensive line, fast receivers. Yes, JT regrets, I'm sure, not going to Corvallis. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I, yeah, and I think JT probably picked Brent. You know, if you're looking at it from the outside looking in, obviously Graham Harrell played a huge part uh -huh. in that. But also just as a brand, I think West Virginia shines a little brighter than the other two. No offense to Connor. Just historically what we've been, you talk, you maybe talk yourself in from the far that I can possibly do what others have done in the past there, whether it be a Will Greer or a Gino or mm -hmm. somebody like that. Sure. And he probably envisioned himself in that mold. Uh, and it just hasn't happened. Now, if he comes back next year, um, you know, which I'm completely open to happening, um, obviously his NFL edition has not gone the way he wants it to go. At this point, he's on the outside looking in at maybe a seventh-round draft pick, most likely going undrafted at this point. Now, I don't know if he gets to the combine and, because he can sling it. You know, arm talent is there, and he might, you know, if he gets in front of a guy, an executive or something like that, or a scout, maybe he can turn some heads that way. But uh, certainly not – his tape doesn't speak to very much right now. Yeah, because, Paul, as you will know, there's a lot of coaches and a lot of scouts out there that are really good at what they do, but they're a little bit blind to this. They feel as though, hey, when they see talent, regardless of how much that player, and I'm not saying JT Daniels has failed in any such way, but maybe right. underachieved in their career, they always feel like they're the guy that can unlock as long as they see the arm talent, the speed, whatever the position is. I'm the guy that can get that out of them. Mm -hmm. There's definitely ego involved with that. Um, you've seen guys like Andy Reid's, uh, I feel like Andy Reid's always been that kind of guy. He always likes to look what I did with that guy. I took a chance on this guy, Patrick Mahomes, nobody knew about. Took a chance on this guy, Donovan McNabb, nobody knew about. I mean, people knew about him, but sure. people at that point in time, especially the way McNabb played, didn't think that he would fit into a pro system. Same thing with Patrick Mahomes. He uses these guys to light up the league. Ego. Have you had much of a chance to see Ninko Markiel play? Obviously, we've got, what, the spring game and you've got high school tape to go on. Yeah, yeah. High school tape is uh, very good. He was the Arizona, Arizona Player of the Year. And you think about the quarterbacks that have come out of Arizona here lately, Spencer Rattler and others. Uh, Arizona's been a hotbed for a really good quarterback play here in the last few years. Um. His probably his most famous game was they they came from 17 points down to to beat a top five ranked team um, inside of uh, I think it was somebody in the comments might have to because I'm just going off memory here and from this is when I was studying his tape in the off season I want to say they they scored 17 in under three minutes to win a game against a top five ranked team um, trying to remember the name of the team that they beat too and if I apologize for that but. Um, but yeah, so that was probably his most famous game. It put him on the map. There's even a YouTube video about it. that has got several hundred thousand views. Uh, he actually threw up on the ball in between plays. Uh, it's pretty wild. Um, but, uh, you know, so the Arizona player, Arizona Gatorade, Arizona player of the year was a big deal. It's a four star rating. Um, everybody you could possibly think of was offering him. He comes into the spring game and has, um, probably the third best day of the day of all the quarterbacks. But what we've heard is he and JT have become really close and he's learned from JT um, pretty closely. And word out of camp is he, what I was told is if it's during a game, Garrett green will come in and play. But if it's an off week and let's say JT gets hurt at the end of the game and we're preparing somebody for the next game, then it would be Nico. I mean, he had a full week to prepare for it. So he has ascended up to, I guess you would call it 2A or 2B between he and Garrett Green, depending on the situation. Um, you know, getting thrown into the fire, I guess they'd rather go with somebody with some experience in Garrett Green than if he has a week to prepare Nico Marchio. But there's a lot of people that think that he is going to be a very, very good player. He's a left-handed player, so there is an adjustment there as well. Um, be interesting to see. He, I would say he probably has a uh, Tim Tebow type skill set as far as his running ability goes. Not the fastest guy, but he's a big kid, a big thick kid. He's tough to bring down. Um, he's an interesting kid for sure. 
John is asking, and we've got it uh, on the banner right there. We've got a call-in show directly after West Virginia Live. Yes, 9 o'clock Eastern time. So in 5 to 10 minutes, we will be live and taking your calls right here at the Voice of College Football. All right. Bishop, and, uh, Bishop Gorman, that was the name. Oh, of the yeah, sport. yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. They produce uh, tons of players. Yeah. Yeah, they went uh, – Hamilton in Arizona went on the road and beat that Bishop Gorman team. Uh, obviously, Gorman was the better team, but they were able to score a touchdown, onside kick, score, onside kick, score. It was a wild scene. Pretty fun. Get on over to Mountaineer Paul's channel right here on YouTube and check out his work on West Virginia football for sure. Get on over there. Uh, what's the best way to find you? And probably if we just do a, a Google search or a YouTube search right here, and I'll, I will drop the um, I'll drop the link in the live chat again. We just had it in there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the channel's grown pretty pretty quick. Um, it's technically I've only been up for about a month now. Uh, we're we're heading towards 300 subscribers, so I feel like that's pretty good, um, and only growing. Uh, several of the videos are growing in number as far as views go up into the thousands, which I'm really proud of. Uh, so I'm excited. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be covering into basketball season as well. If you like basketball. So I'll be doing all that. And you can find me there at Mountaineer Paul talks football and also on Twitter at Paul Mountaineer just reversed. And uh, we've dropped the link in the chat folks. And uh, please subscribe Thanks. to our West Virginia channel. And uh, we would yes. like to get to a thousand subs here pretty soon. It's been a slow climb. We know there are a lot of mountains in West Virginia. It's been a slow climb up the mountain for this channel. I don't know why. Joey and others have told me that uh, that West Virginia fans are they're they're stubborn. You got to takes takes a while for you to prove it to them. So maybe that's yeah. It. I'll be posting more content on this channel as well this week. Uh, we appreciate tomorrow that. we'll be have, we'll have a video tomorrow obviously in the post game but um, i've got some other stuff i'm working on too bad you didn't cover basketball too mark uh or do you do you Ooh. cover basketball no no no, no 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 basketball we've got enough okay. football to deal with believe me no basketball i gave up covering Thanks, basketball Silas. a long time ago a long time ago Paul, appreciate you being here, making this work. Without you, we yeah. don't have the show tonight, so we appreciate I'll you. be here every time you need me. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for that. And again, it's Mountaineer Paul. Get on over there. We just dropped the link in the chat, so uh, check out his work. And I'm going to take calls right here, so it's going to be a different link. But keep right here at uh, the Voice of College Football on the main channel, and we're going to take your calls. I will be back up and running here in about one minute. 